What if climate change wasn't just an environmental problem? What if it was a health problem too? What if your GP called to check how you were managing your medications and fluid intake through yet another heat wave, or to adjust your asthma management plan because of bushfire smoke? What if your GP was overwhelmed by every patient on their books with asthma or lung disease suddenly struggling to breathe. Far-fetched? This happened last summer, our black summer, when 80% of Australia's population was exposed to stifling heat and smoke for months on end. I have a friend who's a doctor in Adelaide, an emergency doctor. In that extreme heat, elderly people, previously well and independent, were presenting with organ failure. Many didn't get home. I'm a doctor too, and I have to admit, I'm scared. I'm scared of the effect climate change is having on our health at only one degree of warming. I'm scared because even if we stop all carbon emissions now, we still only have a 90% chance of limiting warming to two degrees. Now, that might seem like good odds, but would you board a plane that had a 10% chance of crashing? I want you to think about what makes humans healthy for a moment. Because at the end of the day, human health is determined by the health of the environment. It's the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, having thriving ecosystems and a stable climate. Years ago, when I was a medical student, I got arrested protesting against logging beautiful old-growth forests. I didn't consciously make the link to human health back then. I was just trying to save a beautiful ecosystem. But it makes sense. If we damage nature enough, eventually we damage ourselves. In 2009, premier medical journal The Lancet was so sure about the link between climate change and human health that it declared climate change to be the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. Yeah, the greatest global health threat. The evidence was compelling 11 years ago. When COVID-19 arrived, states of emergency were declared and whole countries went into lockdown. Our governments listened to our public health experts and acted decisively. They acted on the evidence. And we all made sacrifices to prevent illness and death, and it worked. Just imagine if we had such a response to climate change. Just imagine if we'd started 11 years ago. I mean, do we want to wait until our own neighborhoods are inundated? Here in Australia, 34 died in our bushfires last summer, but over 400 died from breathing bushfire smoke, which blanketed our skies for months on end. Now it's America's turn. Already over 30 dead and 2.7 million hectares burnt. And it will be months before they will count the health cost of all that smoke. Meanwhile, heat waves cause increased emergency department presentations, ambulance call-outs, and excess deaths, not only directly from heat, but from exacerbating underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular, lung, and kidney disease. Before the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009 that killed 173 people, Melbourne's morgues were already full because twice that number had died in the preceding heat wave. Climate change further damages health by eroding the social determinants of health, employment, living conditions, social cohesion. Livelihoods dependent on tourism and agriculture are particularly vulnerable to damaged ecosystems. For example, there are 60,000 jobs in tourism on the Great Barrier Reef, but our reef has already shrunk by 50%, and we're losing it fast. 
Each year, 100 million tourists flock to Florida's sandy beaches. It's the biggest tourism economy in the world and employs two and a half million people. But Miami Beach and Florida Keys will be underwater within 30 years, regardless of how deeply we cut our carbon emissions. Extreme weather events, bushfires, floods, cyclones and storms cause injury and death, damage property and infrastructure. But communities lose jobs and businesses, causing economic hardship and poorer mental health for many years to come. PTSD, anxiety, depression, increased suicide risk and poorer physical health follow. And climate change affects our mental health directly as well. Already, young people are presenting to their GPs with eco-anxiety and fear of the future. Do you know this word, eco-anxiety? It's one of several now used to describe the psychological effects of climate change. And I'm grateful for this new terminology because it's not just the young who are suffering. The thing is, I think in our hearts, all of us are suffering to some degree if we let ourselves stop and think. I visit the forest that I love with a lot of sadness these days, as well as joy. My favorite walks are never gonna be the same after repeated fire. And I worry for our, for our indigenous and First Nations peoples, whose connection to country is so much deeper than my own. There's a word for this too, solastalgia. Solastalgia is derived from words meaning comfort and pain. It's the homesickness you get when you're still at home, but your environment has been damaged or changed. Do you ever experience this? Are there places from your childhood that have changed, that you miss even as you visit them? Oh, sorry, it's a bit depressing, but I'm nearly finished that part, I promise. <laughs> so with worsening impacts globally, climate refugees will increase and conflict will increase. And it goes without saying, both are terrible for health. Climate change already caused 21 and a half million displacements every year between 2008 and 2016, and it will get worse. So, luckily for all of us, I'm not the only doctor getting more and more alarmed. At last, a climate health emergency has been declared by medical organisations all over the world and by our Australian Medical Association. In fact, recently, organisations representing 75% of Australia's doctors wrote to our Prime Minister, urging him to make the economic recovery from COVID-19 a healthy recovery, one that addressed that other health emergency, climate change. Sadly, he didn't seem to follow doctor's orders last week, but there's still time. And we, there could be such a lot of win-wins if we do this. Let me explain. So we know that the main driver of climate change is the mining and burning of fossil fuels, right? But coal, oil and gas impact our health directly, as well as via climate change. Their combustion releases deadly air pollution, which causes 4.2 million premature deaths globally every year, and 3,000 in Australia. Yeah, 3,000, you thought we had clean air. Uh-uh, that's double our national road toll. We hear about the road toll all the time in the news, never hear about our air pollution deaths. In Australia, air pollution contributes to all our major causes of ill health, chronic airways disease, asthma, heart disease, strokes, and cancer. It increases rates of diabetes and dementia and adverse outcomes in pregnancy, and it's costly. In Europe, the health burden of coal alone is 70 billion US dollars every year. That's the equivalent of the national GDP of Slovenia or Zambia. Transport and vehicle emissions make up about 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but about half the harm from air pollution in Australia. And we drive the dirtiest cars in the developed world. 
because our vehicle emission standards are so lax, so out of date, and we get the cars nobody else wants, the ones that they can't sell in Europe and the UK anymore. I know, you couldn't make it up, right? And this is why, although it's the greatest global health threat, clim tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. It's a win-win. Climate action is, has so many co-benefits for human health. Air pollution-related deaths and disease will drop as renewable energy replaces coal and gas in our electricity grids and as we electrify transport. Better still, good public transport and safe facilities for active transport, walking and cycling, will get us out of our cars and reduce rates of obesity, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Investing in sustainable cities with highly energy efficient building stock, more tree cover, more green space, will reduce the summer heat island effect and improve our mental health. Such a city will develop strong communities, reduce social inequality, and encourage active engagement to the solutions to the climate crisis. If we change our food systems to provide uh, um, plant-rich diets that are affordable, we'll reduce livestock methane emissions and, uh, and improve our health. Regenerative agriculture will ensure our food production is a net win for biodiversity and carbon sequestration. And public health would expand to become the largest part of our health system. From the smallpox vaccine to sanitation, time and time again, major advancements in human health have been due to public health. It's the most powerful medicine we have, and we need it now like at no other time in human history. And we need our governments to lead in this transformation as they have led in the pandemic. But that doesn't stop powerful action by individuals and communities being essential. And that's where you come in. So, how much do we worry about our own health? How much time and money do we invest every day trying to improve our health? What if we allow the climate health emergency to drive our every action for our health and the planet's health? What would that look like on a personal level? So here's the takeaway. There are four things you could change. Food, energy, money, and community. Boy, do we obsess about our diet, right? But a climate-friendly diet is a healthier diet. It's less meat, less dairy, more plants. How about loads of homegrown vegetables, especially the red ones, slow cooked in olive oil? It's the secret of the long life of my first-generation Greek and Italian patients. They turn up on my rehab unit with a joint replacement at the age of 87, and they're still growing their own tomatoes. Energy. One phone call is all you need to switch to green power, 100% renewable energy. And if you're lucky enough to own your own home, install solar PV, electrify your heating and your cooking, then disconnect your gas. Drive less, walk or cycle more. Do you really need that car? Have you ever tried car share? Your next car is going to be an EV, right? Money. Who do you bank with? Are they still invested in fossil fuels? Where's your super? Has your, has your pension fund divested yet? Many have not. Money is powerful and it is 100% in our control. And last but not least, community. Start with your own family and friends. Join a group that visits politicians and advocates climate action. Connect with your neighbours. Start actions with them, because strong communities are resilient in the face of extreme weather. But most importantly, community is good for our mental health. Action with others is a terrific antidepressant. Trust me. 
The solutions for protecting our health and stabilizing the climate already exist. In fact, they coexist. So together, like COVID-19, we can tackle the climate health emergency and have a better chance of saving ourselves and our children's future. Thank you. Thank you.